special edition of the Rick Howe Show as the province's three political leaders face off in Nova Scotia Votes 2013. The Leaders Debate. Brought to you commercial free exclusively by Sleep Country Canada on News 95.7. Now, here's Rick. Good Thursday afternoon and welcome to the show. I'm Rick Howe with you until 7 o'clock this evening, 307 right now. And this afternoon, our first hour, we welcome Nova Scotia's three provincial party leaders to our studio. And for the next hour, we will discuss the issues that are facing Nova Scotians and hear where the party leaders stand on these issues. And after 4 o'clock, we will open up our phone lines and hear your reaction to what was said this afternoon and your thoughts on the election so far with just over a week to go now before Election Day, October 8th. We're breaking this hour into four segments. We'll begin with some discussion about health care, followed by the economy, then energy issues. And the last segment will feature some short questions on a variety of other topics. Our format this hour will feature two of the party leaders beginning each segment in head-to-head -head discussions for approximately four minutes. Then the remaining leader will join in on the conversation for another approximately four minutes. And the last segment will be a free-for-all. The leaders will be giving opening and closing statements as well, and I will pose the questions and as moderator attempt to, well, walk the line, so to speak, keeping some semblance of control while also allowing some freewheeling discussion. So let me introduce to you the three men who want to be the next Premier of Nova Scotia. Daryl Dexter is the leader of the NDP. Mr. Dexter, good afternoon. Hi, Rick. How, how are you doing, doing? Daryl? I'm doing well, thank you very much. Stephen McNeil leads the Liberal Party. Stephen, Rick, how, how you doing? Right. Great, how are you doing? I'm doing well. And Jamie Bailey is the leader of the Progressive Conservatives. Jamie, good afternoon. Hello, Rick. All right, a draw was held this afternoon, just before this debate, uh, to determine the speaking order for the opening and the closing segments. And for the opening statements, uh, Conservative leader Jamie Bailey will begin with his opening statement. Go ahead, Jamie. Thank you, Rick, and good afternoon to all your listeners today. For all those who are looking to replace the NDP, they now have two choices, more of the same or real change that works for people. More of the same means continuing to pay the highest taxes in Canada, watching our power rates continue to go up, and have MLAs continue to collect a rich pension that is far beyond what any other Nova Scotian can ever hope to have. Mr. Dexter promised these things wouldn't happen uh, when he was running last time, but they did. Mr. McNeil promises to do exactly nothing about them now. But doing nothing comes at a great cost, in lost jobs and to the family budget. If you want real change to the way this province is run, starting at the top, I ask you to look at the Progressive Conservative Plan, Change That Works. We will lower the HST to give families a break and create jobs. We will freeze power rates for five years, so no more jobs need be lost. And we'll start our changes at the top by eliminating that rich MLA pension. Don't let anyone tell you these things can't be done. They must be done to turn Nova Scotia around. Thank you, Jimmy Bailey. Now, NDP leader Daryl Dexter. Daryl? Uh, thanks very much, Rick. This is our second debate in two days. And last night, Nova Scotian saw that Stephen McNeil literally has no answers to the tough questions that any premier faces. No answer on jobs, no answer on how to deliver better health care, no answer on how to achieve lower power rates, and Mr. McNeil can't explain why his ads do not tell the truth. There are 13 days left, 13 days to talk to everyone about the important choice they are making. I know that we haven't accomplished everything that people hoped for, but we've made progress. Nova Scotia is stronger now. And that means there is much more that we can do. The NDP will continue working hard to bring good jobs to Nova Scotia so that young people can stay, put down roots, and raise a family here. Because not only are jobs important, but that is how we make sure that we can care for our seniors, improve health care, and give kids a good education, make this a better place to live. Thank you, Rick. Daryl Dexter, thank you, and Stephen McNeil for the Liberals. Thank you, Rick, and thank you to your listeners for tuning in to us. Uh, I want to lead Nova Scotia in a new direction. If elected, I will take a new approach. I've heard from Nova Scotians that they want a government that understands the challenges faced by families, individuals, and businesses. Challenges that have become more difficult under Mr. Dexter's government. We now have fewer full-time jobs, longer wait times for health care services, and the highest power rates in Canada, all under the NDP. I believe our government needs to place the day-to-day -day concerns of Nova Scotia as its number one priority. We must return government to its top priority of jobs, accessible health care, reinvigorating a public school system, and a dedication to finally tackling the problem of high power rates. In each instance, the Liberal Party has a clear and deliberate and well-thought-out plan, 
Unlike the distant and out-of-touch neglect of the Dexter NDP, a new Liberal government will address the challenges facing Nova Scotians. I believe in the strength of our province and the strength of our capital city. I have faith in the ability of Nova Scotians to build a more prosperous capital city and a more vibrant province. And I promise to lead a government that puts Nova Scotia first. Thank you very much. All right. 3.12 is our time. We begin the first of several segments that we will discuss uh, some of the pertinent issues uh, in this campaign. And uh, round number one will feature a head-to-head -head discussion between uh, the NDP's Daryl Dexter and Liberal Stephen McNeil for approximately four minutes. And then PC leader Jamie Bailey will join in. Uh, the uh, first round will deal with health care. And uh, Daryl Dexter, mm -hmm. this question is uh, directed at you. Uh, healthcare blogger Alan Lynch writes in Saturday's Chronicle Herald that the number of health executives earning over $100,000 a year has jumped by 30% in the last 12 months, that the number of healthcare executives in that pay range has increased from 400 to 526, with few, if any of them, involved in providing hands-on direct health care. We have 10 district health authorities in Nova Scotia. You have opposed suggestions by the Liberals and the PCs to trim the number of health authorities, but wouldn't doing so redirect millions of dollars back into frontline health care? No, it would not. And uh, in fact, just first of all, let me just take issue with what was uh, said by Mr. Lynch. I don't know who he is or what his level of expertise is, but the fact of the matter is that we have taken money out of administration. We have, in fact, reduced the number uh, of executives, and, and, and we have implemented the key recommendations of the Ernst & Young study that was designed to uh, bring efficiency uh, into the Nova Scotia system. We have uh, decreased health administration costs by 23% by, by uh, over the last last four years, bringing it down to 4.83%, uh, just above uh, the national average. I was on the Dartmouth General Ho Hospital board the last time the amalgamations took place, the last time uh, the Liberals in power, and I watched what happened. Uh, we saw in this province 1,600 hospitals close, hospital beds close. We saw a thousand nurses. There are people uh, are talking about protecting nurses, those frontline services by eliminating administration. Of, no. Mr. Lynch very look, clearly laid look, out. Mr. Lynch very look, clearly laid out. We have no, those people are not providing frontline services to Nova Scotians. Why do why do we think? that we need 10 CEOs to run the, uh, the district health authorities across this province. You know, we, we understand the uniqueness of the IWK, but think about it for a second. And, and why, why can't we have one executive team in four regions delivering that service across a, a the province? A centralized super bureaucracy. And it's, we have seen it's, this it's happen. Hands, Stephen, just, hold on for a second. A centralized super bureaucracy actually increases the level of administration. They become more expensive. This is what has happened in the other places uh, where this has been done. We watched while it was done here. A thousand nurses were forced there, out of, there will, out no of one's the province you're, as a result of that. And I can tell you, and you just don't get this. You just don't Darryl, get this. I, I was I, on what, the board what I of get, the hospital Darryl, I get, and watched those 16. young nurses who should be in the province today leave because of the last Liberal government's policy with respect to amalgamations. So, what, uh, you know, uh, I, I, I think that's the problem. The problem is, Rick, uh, Mr. McNeil just doesn't get it. Stephen? The, the problem is, Rick, uh, Daryl Dexter would rather protect uh, the executives of the health care system instead of standing up for those very nurses he's just talking about, instead of ensuring so. that Nova Scotians who do not have access to a family physician can have access to a family <laughs> physician. 400 allow, more physicians allow, in Nova community, allow communities to have more say, quite frankly, over their own health uh, infrastructure that they have. Allow community health boards to have a larger say. Allowing, going back to saying to communities, you control your own destiny health care while we trim off the top end of some of the administration component, Rick, and plow that back into frontline <laughs> services. Why do we think Not a so. province of population of less than less than a million people needs Nine people being over, being paid over two hundred thousand dollars who are not in a, not even direct contact with a yeah, single patient. This, this, this shows just exactly how Mr. McNeil is starting off. He's starting off not listening to the very people who are telling him this is a bad idea. The nurses told him this is a bad idea. He took out a full page ad to to, to Darryl, essentially I've had nurses, say they were lying. I've had nurses. No, no, I they, didn't. They, no, that's, the, that's, the town council, town council in Yarmouth asked him not to do it. The Cumberland Health Authority asked him not to do it. Right around the province, people have been saying. This is a bad idea. It will do exactly the opposite of you say. It will take away community voices. This, we should, Dr. John Ross, the expert in emergency medical care himself, said,
said, this amounts to nothing more than administrative busy work. We should be focusing on patient care. We should be making sure that we continue to do what we have done. We attracted 400 new doctors over the last Well, I want to challenge you on that because we had a conversation this morning with doctors Nova Scotia who tell us on, on a year-to-year -year basis. They have with a, Dr. Gillis. Was they, that right? Uh, no, it was a, a, another representative from Doctors Nova Scotia who said uh, on average they bring in about 30 to 40 new doctors a year. Yeah. So where well, do you get this 400 figure? Well, right here. Here's the uh, it's, College of it's Physicians. It's like much of his math. It's, it's right here. <laughs> this is the College of Physicians and Surgeons report. In fact, this uh, was uh, taken uh, earlier today. It says there are 2,701 uh, doctors in the, uh, in, the, uh, in the province today. Here is the data as of uh, as of December 31st, 2008, which is 2,285, 416 more doctors. So the College of Physicians and Surgeons actually records the doctors that are in the province. So uh, our numbers are airtight, and I don't know where he got his point. All right, uh, Jamie Bailey, the uh, leader of the PCs, that uh, get you in on this conversation. Yes, you, uh, your thoughts on what's been said thus far here? Well, it was entertaining, but uh, it didn't tell a single Nova Scotian something helpful. Because what do Nova Scotians want to know? They want to know that there's a family doctor there for them. They want to know that there's a hospital bed when they need one. They want to know there's a long-term care bed when they get to that stage in life that they need one. They want to know that their uh, emergency service is there for them all the time. So, of course, we should have savings in administration. I believe our plan, where we have a rural board and a, a city board in the Ottawa is the right one. Mr. McNeil's one in Halifax is not right for the rural areas. Mr. Dexter's 10 is too expensive. But I want to take this in a slightly different direction. Because we have had strikes and the threat of strikes in our health care system, which have caused real Nova Scotians to go without the services they need. It puts them at risk. Just recently, our paramedics, the emergency service part of health care, uh, reached the 11th hour of a potential strike. Mr. McNeil voted to let them go out on strike. I believe our paramedics are essential. I believe they should be paid, of course, uh, that way, much like police and fire are also essential. And he and I disagree on this, Stephen, and I would like him to explain you, why he thinks, thinks it's much, okay uh, for the, emergency services to walk out. The collective bargaining process is something that's fundamental to workers, not only in this province, but across the country. Fire departments and police departments actually negotiated away the right to strike. Uh, it wasn't taken from them, but they negotiated away at the bargaining table. And Rick, I will have you to say, there are some health care uh, some provinces where they take away the right to strike from health care workers, Every like Alberta. Except ours, but you know what? Actually, They've had more others. strikes than we have. They've had illegal strikes. There's been no essential service mechanism in place. That's been one of the unique things around the collective bargaining process, uh, that uh, you allow it to happen. Unions come together. They put in place an emergency service so that it ensures those valuable services are there for Nova Scotians. Yes, it causes some difficulty. There's no question about that. Listen, but, so, but so, Rick, would having them walk off the job completely with nothing in place, like they have done in other provinces where they've taken away the right to strike. Collective bargaining is sometimes tough. It is. Lawyers, it's it's it is. It is tough. To that because but do you know? Do you know what? Let's hear Jamie Bailey. Yeah, it's, go ahead. It's a process. Because I actually believe Mr. McNeil's vote to let the paramedics go on strike was one of the most irresponsible things I've seen in my time in the legislature, which isn't a long time, I know, but it is. Even Mr. Dexter and his government finally, in the end, saw that we couldn't allow emergency services to not be there when people need them. So I want to give him a little credit for doing the right thing in the end. But we can't go on like this. We're going to change the way this province is running. We have to recognize what 9 out of 10 provinces other than own have recognized, and that's that if we're going to end up in arbitration anyway to make sure that those services are there, we should just declare that. It's common sense. And the only ones in the legislature that didn't get that, that we're going to put Nova Scotians at risk in emergency health care was Mr. McNeil and the Liberals. And Nova Scotians yeah. need to know why. It's, it's We've not, had fewer it's strikes. Not, it's not as simple as uh, either Mr. McNeil or Mr. Bailey say. The, the simple fact of the matter is uh, that you do provoke uh, more... Uh, uh, extreme responses when you bring in uh, these kinds of um, legislated uh, emergency services uh, legislation. You only have to look at Bill 68 when uh, Dr. Hammond, I, th I think you were the chief of staff for the Conservatives at the time. Uh, Mr. Bailey, were you not? You're no, not there. it was you before my yet? time, okay. but that's okay. You've missed a few other facts. You, 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 were, <laughs> you, were, you were part of that administration. The, um, uh, proudly. Uh, uh, and, uh, and what happened simply was that all the nurses resigned.
Um, they resigned. Uh, that forced the Actually, government. they agreed to arbitration they, they, in the, the end, which the is exactly what we're proposing to the, avoid these strikes. The government forced uh, were were forced to accept um, uh, the the right to bar bargain uh, collectively, <laughs> and that is exactly the point. When when sometimes, as we have seen, the question of arbitration uh, becomes uh, may become necessary, but you do not start at the starting point by taking away the rights. Actually, to, to I, I believe that the question is who has to bear the risk? Who has to bear the turmoil? The patients, including emergency patients, or the administration and the bargaining units that have to work it out. And in my opinion, the patients have to come first. The Nova Scotians who need to know an ambulance is there when they need it. They have to come first. And that means declaring in a common sense way that our paramedics, that our health care workers, they are essential and we need another way to work out money disputes other than letting Nova Scotians go without health well, services. All right, and I want to stop you there because we're going to move on to another topic right now. In round two, we'll feature uh, PC leader Jamie Bailey and Liberal leader Steve McNeil. We'll be talking about the economy now uh, for the next uh, 10 minutes or so. Uh, and this question that Jamie Bailey is directed at you. Uh, 1,700 people left Nova Scotia in the first quarter of this year. The largest quarterly population decline since 1971, says Stats Canada. You have promised to increase Nova Scotia's population to 1 million by, what, 2025. Is that a realistic promise, considering the uh, population exodus from Nova Scotia? And how will you accomplish that? Look, most Nova Scotians recognize that our biggest problem, or one of them, is that our population is flatlined and is going into reverse. 1,700 Nova Scotians left because there was no work for them, because they pay the highest tax in the country, because they can't afford their power bills, and they thought they could make a better life for themselves and their families somewhere else. And no, that is not acceptable to me or many Nova Scotians. And quite frankly, doing nothing, as Mr. McNeil proposes, is irresponsible. The cost of doing nothing is that more people will leave, that our problems will get worse, that fewer and fewer of us will pay more and more for less and less. But you so still haven't told us how you're going to bring well, that uh, increase that population. Let me tell you exactly how. We need to set great goals in this province. We need to set great goals. That's what politics should be about. Leaders that actually set goals. A million by 2025 is a great goal we can all get behind by fixing our economy, by lowering taxes like the HST and freezing power rates, by doing what it takes to create the jobs to support a population of that size and if someone says it can't be done they are condemning Nova Scotians to more decline. Stephen McNeil? No answer. That's what he gave you, Rick. The fact of the matter is we need it's a serious problem and it didn't just happen under the NDP government. It's been growing in this province that young people are leaving. That's why we need to modernize the apprenticeship program to provide more apprenticeship opportunities for young Nova Scotians who are graduating from our community college system, allow some flexibility in the training model so that employers can do some of that training, the unions can do some of that training uh, to make sure that our young people get that opportunity at that first job here. I have a son who's leaving, left this province to go to Alberta because it, it wasn't because of high taxes. It wasn't because of power rates. It was because he had no job. So he went to Alberta they're to get... actually related, he, he went to, he went That's to, what he you went, don't get. He went, he went, to, he went, to, he went exactly to Alberta related. to get a job. So we open up a job opportunity is what we're talking about. If you look at the university sector that we have, we have 13,000 other sons and daughters of Canadians who come to this province. Let's figure out how do we keep them here. We believe we do that by investing in research and development. That's why we have a grants program provided there that would allow 300 university graduates to stay and start an opportunity for themselves here in Nova Scotia. You look at uh, looking at the small business sector who are out there working, hiring in, uh, one and two Nova Scotians at a time. We need to be supporting them. How do we do that? Uh, same way we do graduate, we, we reward them for hiring a university graduate or a community college graduate by a payroll rebate at the end of the year, acknowledging the hard work that they've been doing on behalf of us, keeping young people here, but, but, but just Jamie, talking yes, about high let taxes. Let me ask you, we, we, we talk about... tinkering around the edges. Mr. You want increased immigration? The How are we going to do that? I want increased immigration and, and, by thousands and thousands. But we, have, we now know that immigrants who are coming here who end are up in Toronto or Montreal home. or Vancouver. Because there's no jobs. It's great to say we should have more apprenticeships. I agree with that, except they have to be matched to a real job. And to say that our taxes and our power rates aren't hurting jobs 
jobs is to that's show no, that's how not ignorant what, that's you not are what, about that's how not what, the That's not what really I said, works. Jamie, but well, that's not what I said. Why don't you do something but about it? You're running for premier Jamie, the same not as me. Jamie, not $800 million tax cut. Hang on, Jamie. Jamie, let him million dollar tax cut is not creating a job. It's driving that. You are. We have a balanced plan where every dollar is accounted for. Jamie, your platform, you have not. Hang on, guys. One at a time here, Jamie. You have not told a single one of the people what program you're going to do. And we laid out a very balanced plan. Hang on, Stephen, please. Jamie, go ahead. Look, quite frankly, you want this election to be about trust? You're asking people to trust you to do exactly nothing. That's too low a bar because there's a cost to doing nothing. And the cost is more of the same. And we've seen under Mr. Dexter what more of the same looks like. And you're condemning our families to the same thing. Stephen? Continue to pay the highest uh, tax uh, Rick, in the country while people move away. Rick, what I, what I, on, Jamie, what I said to Nova Scotians is I'm going to tell them the truth. The truth is we've laid nothing. we've laid out a very balanced plan. We've invested in public education. We invested in the service that Nova Scotians want. We've targeted job creation to keep those young people that you're referring to here. We've done that all with increasing expenditures by half of one percent, half of one percent. And now Mr. Bailey yeah. says he's going to cut eight hundred million dollars in taxes and not tells true. Nova Scotians it won't affect their health care. It That's won't affect. True. Let's bring we, let's bring Daryl into this conversation now. Hang on, hang on, guys. Premier, if there was you're that much money sitting around, around, he would have done that already. Daryl Dexter, the NDP. Well, with all respect, it's hard to believe that Mr. McNeil says what he said to people. He's still telling the truth because the fact of the matter is that every television ad that he has run with respect to our record is your completely ads. false. So your, it's right? your record. They're completely false, and you know that. Either either you know it. And and you won't admit it, or you know it, and you don't care. Daryl, they're, they're your press. They're your press releases that the numbers come off no, of. They're you your know, press that, releases. That is wrong, <laughs> well, wrong, let, wrong. Let That's me, not true. Let me put no, this. No, first hang on, Jamie. Hang this on. This is why this is important. It's this your press release, Stephen. Hang on a second. Uh, last night, I asked Mr. McNeil if he would uh, agree to invest uh, to make sure that there were 400 jobs that came to Cape Breton uh, with an employer who's looking at coming here, and he said no. no. Uh, we'll only we won't do anything uh, but uh, but repayable loans. And what he doesn't seem to understand is that uh, many companies that want to come here, they're going to make very large capital expenditures, and they ask the government to partner with them when they make those capital improvements that's going to be able to create those jobs. In Ontario, the Wynn government just put $75 million into a project that's going to bring a couple of thousand jobs with Ford Motor Company. Uh, she gets that if a government wants to attract investment, they have to, they have to be partners with people. He would force companies, including companies that are already here, out of this province uh, into other uh, parts of the country. And, I, and so he would drive uh, down uh, employment. The last time the Liberals were in power, the rate of unemployment in this province was 12%. Well, let me and jump with in his on plan, that. sure, go ahead, that's Jamie. exactly yeah, what exactly. going back to. I want to ask Stephen first here, though. Does it, your plan, though, uh, again, is there a Not risk the that uh, you will drive away businesses? Because other jurisdictions offer incentives yeah, and, and breaks. And, and, and if we don't, I mean, how are we going to bring business here? Not at all, Rick. Uh, what we need to be doing is protecting taxpayers' money. It makes no sense to... Uh, be uh, giving forgivable loans out. Uh, I mean, here we have uh, the Irvings one, the largest ship procurement contract in the history of our country, and we give them a, a, a $260 them million dollar a free loan. Not well, a we cent. need to make an investment. <laughs> there are things we can do, and it, and it should be in and around employee training, should be in and around ensuring that the number of employees there are no job guarantees associated with. And if we're going to lay that money out there, the province should be the lender of last resort. Under Mr. Dexter, the province has become the lender first. Well, those are all well, when do you come into this? Where, where does the PCs Here's come into this? Here's the double danger to our economy from what Mr. Miel says. I actually agree with him. We've got to stop doing things the old way with these corporate handouts. But we have to replace that with something else that's going to work. To say we're going to stop doing the old way, but then we're going to leave our taxes at the worst in the country and our power rates at the worst we in the country is to doubly condemn Nova Scotians to more lost jobs. Now, I know Mr. Miel doesn't want to cut things in government, but we can actually do this. We've listed out in our platform everything that'll go in administration and so on, and we've given a shining example at the top, which is the MLA pension plan, which is outrageous compared to average Nova Scotians. Mr. McNeil himself is due for a $4 million pension. I asked him last night if he would cut that with me, and he said no. He wants to study it some more. Well, you know what? This is a moment of leadership right now. We don't need to study whether it's right or wrong that politicians get pensions that are so much richer than everyone else. And I gave Mr. McNeil an opportunity last night to at least show that he's serious, and he blew it. Well, I'm serious, and if we start there, Nova Scotians will know 
that we can change the way this province runs for the better through real action. Daryl Dexter, let's hear your views on this pension issue. I mean, well, this uh, is look, a sore uh, point with a lot of voters. No, I, I think it ought to be done by uh, by independent uh, reviews. Mr. McNeil, uh, Mr. McNeil uh, and Mr. Bailey uh, last time uh, went through that independent review process. And it wasn't enough. Um, and he, he says it wasn't enough. You supported it. He supported it, but he, he said <laughs> it wasn't enough. Fixed. I'm not done. <laughs> so if it's in the right direction and, and doesn't get to the result you want, then that's somehow not fair. I, I, don't, I, don't think that, that, I don't think that's, that's absolutely well, I just don't agree that but politicians here's, but here's get four million dollars. But here's the thing. So here's, right. But here's the thing. Uh, uh, to look at it. Uh, look at it from this perspective. You, you've said that you would like to see a broader independent panel, so that you know other people would be included. Uh, you know, I, don't, I don't really. I haven't actually heard Mr. McNeil disagree with that. I, I, I haven't have, disagreed I, at all. I, the, I only, the, never, only, the only the only thing I said, Daryl, which I think here, Stephen, the only thing I've said is that we should look at the entire compensation compensation package together. We've heard that for we, years. We've done it in isolation. When Mr. Bailey was chief of staff, we looked at salaries. And we caused kept them. It caused and the problem. When you no, guys you, were un in, unfortunately you let you the pension Unfortunately, you didn't. That's unfortunately, you didn't. Right, so we ended, no. up, we ended up no, with that's that. that's not true. Yes. That largest, isn't true. The largest increase in, 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 in recent one actually yeah. came in the Ham administration. No. Absolutely. He yes. said no. The point of the matter is... Hang on. I want to hear Stephen. Hang on, guys. There should be an independent review, but it should look at the totality of the compensation package. And by the way, his figures around a pension for me are way out of whack. No, they aren't. You should at <laughs> My wife just fell off her chair. Huh. All <laughs> right, we're going to change the subject here and to go on to another category. Every uh, just Ocean falls off their chair when they hear how much politicians get. <laughs> just to remind our listeners here this afternoon, uh, this is a debate of the three party leaders uh, as we prepare to vote on October 8th. Uh, round number three, we'll talk about energy. This will feature Daryl Dexter, the NDP, against Jamie Bailey of the uh, PCs. And this question is directed at you, Jamie Bailey. Uh, you have promised to freeze power rates for five Five years, we're told we are doomed to repeat the mistakes of the past if we ignore history. The Buchanan government, as you know, froze power rates, and when the freeze ended, rates shot up, and Nova Scotia Power was so deep in debt, it was privatized and sold. Why isn't, uh, well, your plan, isn't that a repeat of the Conservative government debacle of John Buchanan? No, of course not. The problem is the debacle of Mr. Dexter's policies, which drive up our rates, which try to get us to renewable energy while we're still paying for the old energy, so we're paying twice. Mr. McNeil doesn't even address that root cause. The problem is that for more than four years, our natural gas has gone somewhere else to lower their power rates where ours go up. I'm the only leader here prepared to make the multitude of policy changes necessary at the top of government to stop the increases in rates. And by the way, when it comes to the Maritime Link, which could be a good project, uh, but it's the wrong financial deal. Mr. Dexter signed, and even the URB says, no, that's too expensive for Nova Scotians. Freezing rates means that we send a clear message to Amera and the Maritime Link partners that if they really want to build that project, then it has to fit within our current rates. No one else is saying that. I believe for those that criticize our five-point plan to stop the rate increases, they are telling Nova Scotians, as Mr. Dexter and Mr. McNeil are, that they accept they always have to go up. But you know what? They're going down in other places. They're going down all over New England. They're going down in other parts of Canada. What is unique about Nova Scotia that makes them go up here? It's the policies of the last four years. And that's the ridiculous. False go ahead, Darrell. It's just completely ridiculous. Nova the, Scotia the power powers system, running around, which no one believes. The power believes. system that we have today was put in place by by former uh, conservative and liberal governments. We didn't build the generation plants. You, 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 uh, while it was a crown corporation under liberal and conservative governments, they they tied the the entire electrical generation system to fossil fuels. The price of coal went up by seventy five percent, and therefore the people's rates went up. There is, you know, there. The, but his, your answer. Is so, put them up more. No, that's, no, that's actually, the record. The, it's it, not the even increases from renewables is lower than the increases of fossil fuels. That's the whole point. They are you, going you, up. They are, not, they are not volatile. They are based on capital costs and therefore be, can be amortized over 30 or 35 years and therefore remain stable all the so time. How much that the power is a, cost that the is that is the value. We you saw that. That was before the utility and review. But we board. don't no, know we don't yet know how the much the yes, how much the cost of those They, they said exactly the blend the, the the blended right rate per kilowatt hour was right in the rate right in no, the No, right. they were very clear no. that they will make a rate application later. You, you see, know, Rick, you know, the only way people will know for sure, what their power bill says next year and the year after and the year after is if we freeze rates under the PC five-point you know, plan. Mr. McNeil and Mr. Dexter, 
They no, can talk yeah. as much as this they cannot. want, but they can't answer the simple question, either one of them. How much will that change my power? Yeah. Well, how much Except will that, Daryl? Well, they, they said in uh, in the paper that it was nine cents a kilowatt hour, that that was That's what the blended rate was going to be. It was what the blended rate Without was going to be. Without the guarantee of well, the cheaper no, power, and the, which they rejected. The, the guarantee, uh, the, the condition that, uh, that the Utility Review Board uh, put on, which was to simply make sure that that block of power actually can go. Which you didn't ask for when you had the chance. Both Nalcor and uh, and the utility have said they don't believe there's any going to be any problem. So the the problem really Why didn't is they do it the first time. The, the problem so really is that neither Mr. McNeil or Mr. Bailey can take yes for an answer. They, they, they they've said yes, we're going to do this. Yes, we're going to comply with the uh, with the utility and the, the review problem, board. Mr. Dexter, is um, you said yes to Nova Scotia Power they, every time they came. No, in your that is for the last that, well, four they years. don't. That's don't, what you know, we have to fix. I, I, I'm, I'm going back know, to the power rate freeze promise, and, and I'm still. There is understand. no rate freeze well, fairy here. Well, there's well, nobody no, with there a magic isn't. wand but that's going to freeze rates. There's a rate increase rates. demon, Mr. But, uh, Dexter, which you've <laughs> unleashed on Nova Scotia. At the end of five years, though, Jamie Bailey, why why aren't we to expect that during your rate freeze, why aren't we to expect that power rates will shoot right because up at the end of five years? it doesn't defend on pushing costs forward in the future. It doesn't require taxpayers' money. This we can do by changing the policies of government at the top, extend the renewable target forward five years, Can't do which that. is responsible for two-thirds of our rate increase. It absolutely can be done. It's that a matter would be of provincial a violation law. of federal law. Oh, that is because crazy. They, because that they is crazy. We yeah. Who comes first? A sustainability, a sustainability agreement. Yes, because you didn't with, care what our with, rates were. With the federal government that says that we get to meet those environmental standards that that they put in law. We're still going to meet on them a particular, in an affordable way. On, on a particular schedule. If you if you violate that memorandum of, of agreement, then what you are going to force on well, on so Nova Scotians is about a billion dollars in additional costs. That's actually going to no, increase. All right, true. Stephen McDill, you're saying hang on, guys. I want to bring Stephen McDill into this you just, conversation you, you now. You really don't Thanks. understand. Hang on, Daryl Dexter, David McDill, Stephen McDill. One of the issues NDP are, also, are trying to meet uh, the renewable standards set by the previous Conservative government. Uh, I think all Nova <laughs> no, Scotians. No, they changed want, them. Oh, Jamie, hang on. Scotians, should read the I think bill. all Nova Scotians want us to get to where we have more renewable energy. The question is, how do we do that? If you look at the Muskrat Falls project, I think in principle. People think that the, the, the project has merit. It was the deal that people had concerns with. What the Utility Review Board, Review Board actually said was that the original deal put forward by Mr. Dexter and the NDP was the, not the cheapest cost option. It was, it was too expensive for Nova Scotia. Then true. they said, That's if you true. can go make arrangements to get an additional 15 to 20 percent of the energy at market value, then that would make sense for Nova Scotia rate It was payers. included it was, in the application. Just, just for a sec, Rick. That's what they said. <laughs> That's not what they said. If you ask them. <laughs> And, the, and our own uh, <laughs> consumer advocate on the board said the only way we're going to bring down <laughs> rates in the province of Nova Scotia is to allow the competitive pressures to come on Nova Scotia power. We need to break that monopoly and allow competition in an energy. But market. how are you going to break that monopoly? Because so we've seen this in other locations where I, I, unbelievable power rates ever. or in, in it's energy pretty, costs it's pretty, have risen. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, you go in and you uh, legislate that uh, renewable energy producers allow sec sell directly to customers. As you know, How Rick, much does that say? As you know, Rick, there are uh, municipal Zero. utilities right now who have that right. Every one of them. Every one of those municipal utilities is selling their energy cheaper to their customers than Nova Scotia Power is selling it to in us. In rural parts of this province, but what about the people in the city well, here? Well, in 2007, if the former Conservative government had had the courage to allow renewable to retail, the HRM had actually signed an agreement with two large wind producers, one of them would have been in Guysboro, would have stabilized energy prices. And right now, Rick, they would, the, the budget for energy that HRM would have been paying would be less today, and the money saved could have been used for services, could have been used to reduce property taxes, a whole host of things. The reason they didn't is because they it caved increases to the cost the lobby, to everybody else. Because they right. came to the lobby of Nova Scotia Power. It the increases challenge the cost here to everybody is that else. Both Conservatives and New Democrats want to allow. Nova Scotia okay. Power to have a monopoly, not only when you extract energy with okay, okay, hang on, let's hear Daryl Dexter on this when one. When you extract small markets out uh, to allow someone to make a profit, what happens is everybody else pays for the rest of the capital cost of the system, which means the rates go up for everybody else. That's the problem. That's what we've seen in Alberta. That's what we've seen in other parts in, in there, California. There, we see these dramatic, <laughs> these dramatic increases. They they increased by I think it was fifty percent in a couple of days at one point they, in time. They, they're falling. So so. 
you see, this is the this but, this is the problem. Yeah, you make that, fun of that, the rate freeze. These things happen. But we have heard. But just I'll throw this. We've heard that there are issues with Muskrat Falls in Newfoundland right now. That there's a Quebec court challenge uh, pending. Uh, that there's questions about this deal that the Premier of Newfoundland announced uh, between Nalcor and Emera that we don't know the details yet. Uh, so there has been talk in recent weeks about this this whole Muskrat Falls project being in trouble, Daryl Dexter. No, it's not. It's, it's not. not. And in fact, the 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 reality is that right now what they're doing is working through the final details of a proposal that will come to the Utility and Review Board. They'll meet the condition. In fact, that right now, um, they there are uh, people out negotiating for work on, uh, on the Maritime Link. Uh, and, of course, there's already been investments made in that project. Uh, you know, we all hope it works and fits within our current rates. But it's an outright fantasy to say that there will be competition to Nova Scotia Power. No one believes there'll be two or three or four Nova Scotia Powers running around. It shows you how little you know about it, No, it shows you how little you know, because about it, really. our plan actually really. says build a maritime grid, and then without the cost and the hardship That's of what, what the maritime liberals are does. saying, we'll have New Brunswick Power, Nova grid. Scotia Rick, Power, Rick, Maritime Rick, Electric, all competing Rick, for our power, Rick. and we don't have to go through the hardship. You know, what Mr. Neal's <laughs> talking about, it was tried in New Brunswick, and you know what happened? Their rates went up, their own audit General called it a failure, and oddly, renewable energy went down. And how do you There's respond to that, Jamie Bailey? In North or, uh, America, Stephen McNeil, how, how do you worked. respond to that? Don't answer <laughs> that. To Rick, so, no, no, no. <laughs> so, but how do you respond? Fact, that's that's a trend. He doesn't know. In, in, he doesn't in, New know. in New Brunswick, it's a government owned monopoly. In this province, it that's is a private sector point. monopoly, Rick. What you need to do is allow. Why, why are they afraid to allow competition in the energy market? We just heard this week Not just the Municipal right, Utilities signed a 16 megawatt agreement to buy wind from its independent power producer because they have the right to do so. Why shouldn't Michelin? Why shouldn't uh, some of our large energy producers have that same right so to do that in this province? So what's the price province? of power well, under your plan? Why if you, shouldn't if they you, do that? If you have your own one at a time, one at a time, please. A competition will set that. No, but competition you have the same problem as Mr. Dexter. You don't Jamie, know. you know as well as I do. They hang on, that hang on. One at a time, please. Jamie, you finish this off. The only way to know what the price of power is, is to have the political will to change the policies of government to take the pressure off our rates and freeze them for five years. Nobody believes there's going to be four or five Nova Scotia powers running around. That's a fantasy. The rates go up everywhere else. What Mr. McNeil is talking about has been tried. He either knows it or he doesn't understand how the system works. He has the same problem as Mr. Dexter with the Maritime Link. How much will that energy cost? He can't answer the question. I I did did answer Nova Scotians are tapped out. I did answer the question. And in fact, what they showed in their application, what they showed in their application on the Maritime Link was that there would be small increases, less than a percent for the first four years, and then after that, every year the cost of power. That's not. That's not actually what the application is. That's exactly what the application is. Three is the our time. We're going to be a little little We're going to move on to what we call our short snappers right now. This is a debate between the three party leaders: Stephen McNeil, the Liberals, uh, Jamie Bailey, the Progressive Conservatives, and Daryl Dexter of the New Democratic Party. Uh, and we're going to spend the next uh, well, 15 minutes approximately, with what we refer to as short snappers. Uh, and we invite uh, questions will be directed at <laughs> short hasn't been the, <laughs> yeah, well, the rule so far. So far, I will direct the question at one of the anyway. three. But we invite all of you to participate in the discussion. Uh, and Daryl Dexter, this first. First question is for you. The mayor of Halifax says that he would like to see a sports stadium built in the city, and perhaps one day Halifax would host a CFL franchise. Yeah. Would you as premier support providing funding, taxpayers' dollars, for a stadium in Halifax? Well, what I've said before is that a stadium, like any like any project, has to have a business case. Uh, I, I never arbitrarily rule out uh, any particular project, but I want to see a business case. I want to see something that is sustainable for the long term, uh, and I've invited uh, him, and, and I've invited... In fact, I invited uh, you know past proponents to bring uh, a sustainable um, a business case on, on a project, and I'm happy to have a look at it. Stephen McNeil, what about you? I think it's uh, it's something we should be exploring if uh, if uh, we can build a a proper uh, partnership, but with the private and public sector. Um, uh, one of the things with very few uh, uh, precious public dollars that if we're going to invest them in community infrastructure, we need to do it in a way that leverages uh, the uh, private sector dollars to expand that investment uh, to give us the infrastructure in the province that. Uh, I think most citizens want. So is that a yes to fu- pu- uh, public money funding partially some of the stadium? I, I would I would enter into the conversation with them, sure. Uh, if what it, But it would depend on what that looked like and the deal looked like. I think it would be irresponsible for us not to at least enter into that conversation. But it would depend on, at the end of the day, what that uh, what that project was. Jamie Bailey? 
Look, I believe Halifax deserves uh, a world-class stadium. Uh, however, uh, there is no specific proposal, and it's it's not right to endorse one until we know we have a proposal that's affordable, that fits within a balanced budget, and so on. I'm not prepared to sign a blank check like Mr. Dexter did with the Maritime Link, or like Mr. McNeil did when he criticized Mr. Dexter's $100 million pre-election spending spree and then said he's going <laughs> to keep no all that <laughs> money and spend it himself. Uh, so the right thing to do here is to say, yes, this is a target just, that we want to hit, can't help yeah. but we have <laughs> to be able to afford it. So, well, so here's go, the odd like thing, oh, like thing about Mr. McNeil's response. He is saying that he would be prepared to put money into a, into a public-private partnership that would support a CFL franchise, but he wouldn't put any money uh, into a company that's coming here to create jobs for Nova Scotians. Now, that is a contradiction in the first order. No, Not it, the first, but uh, I, I, a I, substantial I, I disagree. One. We're talking about community infrastructure. It's just no different than, uh, Rick, if you go across rural Nova Scotia. Government has a responsibility to ensure that the community infrastructure is in place, uh, whether that is investing in some of the sporting equipment. But it equipment would support a private see, franchise, or, or right? I mean, that's what you're, no, what you're talking he about. He asked me about a stadium, uh, what we said, and, and it's no different than I was with when it came to the convention center. Uh, we I supported the decision that was made by the government, which was uh, making sure that what uh, the small amount of public money that was put in that was leveraged to make a, a to a five hundred million dollar project. Uh, made sense. Uh, left us with the uh, con- so we'll the leave answer, us with a convention center, so and we'll is, allow a private sector. Municipal, to grow, yes, so. but if it's a private, public, private uh, uh, enterprise, you're saying no to the state. Oh, we would be. We they would pay us back. Quite okay. frankly, they would pay us back. Just why? Really? Why do you have to okay. give it away? <laughs> Uh, this next question uh, will be directed at you, Stephen McNeil. Uh, Halifax. Exactly the opposite. He ended in exactly the opposite place from where he started, just so everybody understands. All right. A Halifax teacher, Stephen McNeil, recently wrote an open letter to all the candidates who are running in this election and said that if she had the resources, she would have taught her children privately, suggesting that Nova Scotia's public school system is failing our kids. Do you agree? And you have also promised a review of the school curriculum, yet you have provided very few details on this review. Uh, what would the review entail? And do you agree with her claim that the uh, public school system is indeed failing our kids? There is no question that uh, there are some challenges. I am uh, very proud of the fact that my two children went through the public school system in the province of Nova Scotia. have each had an opportunity to obtain quality education. Uh, gone, one of them has gone off to university. Uh, the other has uh, gone went to community college, finding uh, great education here in the province of Nova Scotia. But there needs to be changes. One of the things our curriculum has not been reviewed uh, for since since uh, John Buchanan was the premier of the province of Nova Scotia, it is time that we have a wholesome look at the curriculum to ensure that it is meeting uh, the expectations of our kids. And we need to move to the point where social grading has become a thing of the past. We can no longer continue to uh, just move kids through the system. There has to be expectations, and our kids uh, need to understand that if you don't work hard, if you don't achieve. Uh, that you're not going to get well, the opportunity. Well, well, what about uh, the social well, grading aspect? Okay, I mean, well, we, we've heard this before that there yeah, are kids who are, are they don't fail kids anymore. Yeah, I know, and and I and I know that's part of uh, the pitch that Mr. McNeil uh, is making. Uh, the, it seems to me that if we're going to actually um, if we're going to actually support kids, we should be looking at ways to make them succeed, not uh, talking about the way that we make them fail. Um, he's wrong about the curriculum review. They take place uh, regularly. In fact, uh, the curriculum with respect to math has actually been changed to focus more on those aspects of math which are specifically um, uh, uh, beneficial uh, for their completion uh, of uh, uh, of uh, high school math. Uh, we have changed uh, the reading programs now so that it is more inclusive. It goes from primary uh, to three. We are, um, we are dealing with uh, class sizes with caps right up to grade six now. Um, and I think more importantly is in the O years, we all have to recognize that the schools and the, the kids that we ha- have in the schools today, the challenges that they face are greater than they were in the past. Mm-hmm. So that's why we're going to put more money into guidance counselors, more guidance counselors there, more mental health clinicians, um, uh, making sure that youth center coordinators are actually um, attached to the schools. Uh, this is all designed to make sure we get the right services in the school to actually support our kids. Yeah. Jamie Billy, do you, you agree Rick. that the public school system is failing our kids Listen, today? The best investment that we can make in the future is in our public school system, absolutely. Our platform to change the way this province runs actually puts most of its new money into our public education system, not by dumping it in the top, uh, not by not asking for anything in return, 
uh, but by actually requiring that that money be used to give taxpayers who pay it a real return in smaller class sizes, in more education assistance for kids that struggle, in report cards that matter to parents. And here's the problem now, and it's a hardship for too many families, and it's September, so it's a good time to raise it. Uh, your kid comes home from school, their list of school supplies is now in average almost 400 Dollars. That's why we're proposing to give families a break with a tax credit against those school supplies until our investments but what, can what kick about in the, what and What about the people who can't afford supplies in the first place? Well, that's why we're giving them a break. Neither one of the other two parties is. But to me... But you're, you're giving a break to the middle class who can probably afford no, to actually, pay... Actually, Rick, it's the kids, and actually it's for teachers as well. The kids. We want every kid to get an equal education. And one of the things that holds the ones back that are from more modest income families is they can't afford the school supplies on the same basis as others, and I don't want that there to happen. There should just be proper supplies that's in the why schools giving, in the first place. Well, well, I agree with that, why, but I, there isn't, you know, so the answer well, is no, there isn't. No, no, hang on a second. No, 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 the, the, the answer is, uh, is the simple fact that we have you know, we have seen uh, uh, an erosion over many, many years. Uh, right now, uh, and and we understand that there are challenges, but right now we have the highest per capita funding that we've ever had in our history for for kids. There's a lot more that needs to be done, and a, and a, and attacking that question of how they the the schools are properly resourced, I think, is a big question over the next number of years. We've got a, an issue with obesity, uh, especially among our youth uh, in Nova Scotia, among the highest obesity levels in the country. Uh, Stephen McNeil, one of the criticisms has been to the public school system as they cut back in gym classes. Would a Liberal government uh, increase gym class times? Uh, it, would, it would be, Rick, part of uh, what would be part of the curriculum review uh, and looking at uh, do we uh, engage parents, uh, teachers, communities, uh, what, what we want uh, the uh, eight hours a day that our kids are at school to look like. How do we want, what do we want uh, the activities that they're associated with? Uh, I've been fortunate. We were fortunate. My kids were fortunate. Andrew and I had the ability to, you know, enter them into many uh, activities uh, to be able to. What we need to ensure, though, is uh, for those families and those children who not, aren't that f not as fortunate, uh, they need to have access to those sports and they need to be done in an affordable way. And in my view, you can do that. Uh, the best way to do that is in the public school system. And it's also important around the physical activity aspects that we recognize nutrition. I want to congratulate the premier. Uh, I think it was his wife who got him on his uh, got him on his new diet. But Why, thank you. I want to, but but it is it is you it is it is. Well, it, it, no, it's it's okay, Jamie, to compliment somebody once in a while. Uh, but you know uh, the reality of it is that's that is something we need to talk to young people about. Is that reach for the apple, not the bag of chips. And Jamie, you yeah. want to get into sure, comment I on do, this? Sure, I do because here's the problem with what Mr. McNeil is saying. It all sounds good, and of course we all agree we want to have more nutrition and more exercise and more. <laughs> gym class, uh, but he doesn't hold himself to his own standards uh, for others when we talk about education. Putting more money into the system, as long as there's this incredible bureaucracy of eight school boards and all the superintendents and vice presidents that are there, means none of it gets to the kids. So you'd eliminate oddly, school boards as well? We are going to cut them in half. And oddly, uh, unlike health, where Mr. McNeil is determined to have one, he accepts the entire bureaucracy in education in his platform. In this case, well, if you're going to make these investments, uh, you should show where the money's going to come from. And in our case, we've fully spelled out the savings in administrative costs in education and committed to putting every dollar back into classrooms, including like the programs but, that you just right. talked about. That's the responsible way to go about it. What Mr. Bailey doesn't realize about that is, of course, is that we just, we, we took the money out of administration already, uh, and in fact, they're running at bare, they're running at bare bones at this point. Uh, again, that is focusing on the wrong end of the system. We should be focusing on the kids, making okay. sure they get... Mr. Bailey money. spent every dollar about four times. Uh, <laughs> uh, I've got one more and quick, one quick, one more quick I issue I want to throw. Hang on, guys. Hang on a second here now. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I had a whistle, I blow it. Boys, boys, boys. Uh, I got a quick question here for Jamie Bailey to talk about public transit. Nova Scotia, one of the few provinces that doesn't provide funding for public transit. Yeah. Would a conservative government do that? Look, we have been very clear in our platform change that works, that we need a province-wide transportation strategy that's a mix of private transit, public transit, cooperative transit, that it's harder today to get around the province from one community to another than it was 50 years ago. And that's not right. We also were very clear when it came to metro transit that we want to make sure that that service is always available to people. Uh, many, many Nova Scotians rely on it every day to get to work, to go to the grocery store, the drugstore. And as you will remember, Rick, we went for 44 days without bus service in the past year. Both Mr. Dexter and Mr. McNeil were fine to leave it okay. that way, but I am not. We're going to... 
end this debate here now. I'm sorry that the time is up here. We do have uh, network commitments to, uh, as well oh, that we have to meet. To. Well. <laughs> but <laughs> it is time for the closing comments. And uh, based on the order of the draw, uh, Liberal Leader Stephen McNeil uh, will start it off. Stephen, much, go ahead. I want to thank everyone who listened to today's debate for your interest in the future of the province and our capital city. As a province, we have a great task before us. And that task is to help ensure a better future for Nova Scotia families, individuals, and businesses. It's a big job, and it needs a change in direction. It's change that means that a government that stays in touch with the real needs of Nova Scotians. The Liberal plan is based on advice from Nova Scotians, and we will concentrate on the issues that matter most. Jobs, health care that put patients first, a school system that helps young Nova Scotians and families excel in a changing world. All of that can be boiled down to a simple premise. Our greatest resources are people, and a government's best investment is in its people. Respectfully, I want to be your Premier. I want to be the change you can trust, and I want to be the change you deserve. On October 8th, I ask for your vote. Together, we can make Nova Scotia stronger. Stephen McDill, thank you very much. Uh, Jamie Bailey, uh, you are next. Thank you. Today, you've heard two very different ways to replace the NDP. For Mr. McNeil, you would still pay the highest taxes in Canada, and your power rates would continue to go up. And MLAs would continue to collect millions of dollars from their rich pension plan that no other Nova Scotian can ever hope to have. You deserve real change to the way this province is run. That's what our PC plan, Change That Works, is all about. It's a balanced plan that shows Nova Scotians how we will pay for every one of our plans. But more importantly, it's based on the countless stories that you have told me about how tough it has been. We will lower your taxes and freeze power rates for five years, giving your family a break and creating more jobs. We will get rid of that gold-plated MLA pension plan that no other Nova Scotian enjoys. We can balance the budget and stop racking up more debt for our children to pay. Don't let anyone tell you that can't be done. It has to be done. We will change this province starting at the top. So I ask Rick, you and your listeners to uh, read our plan and support real change that works for families. Thank you, Jamie Bailey, leader of the Progressive Conservative Party. Daryl Dexter of the NDP, you're up now. Well, thank you to everyone who listened. Oh, turn on the, get the mic closer there. Uh, there we go. Okay. Well, thank you to everyone who listened uh, this afternoon. Uh, in the last hour, you've heard some very different ideas about the future of our province. Mr. McNeil and Mr. Bailey each said that they would make Nova Scotia the only province in Canada that doesn't fight to attract jobs. Think about that. They would let other provinces get the new jobs that should be here for our young people. Mr. McNeil and Mr. Ba Bailey also told you that they would waste your tax dollars on a centralized super bureaucracy in health care. The last time the Liberals did that, they created chaos in health care, closed 1,600 hospital beds, and drove 1,000 nurses out of the province. So I'm asking every one of you who voted NDP last time to think hard about the future. Nova Scotia is stronger now than it was four years ago. And my question is simple. Do we keep going forward together, creating more jobs and training opportunities and better health care for families and seniors? Or do we go back to the past with the Liberals or the Conservatives? I hope you'll vote for your NDP candidate on October 8th. Let's finish what we started. Thank you. Daryl Dexter, the NDP, thank you very much. And uh, let me just thank all three of you for thank you, uh, thank a you, very uh, entertaining, I think, and informative <laughs> debate, I hope. And I hope that uh, people who are listening here this afternoon... Uh, it helped them make up their minds, and uh, we encourage everybody, of course, that on uh, October the 8th uh, to get out and vote. And, of course, uh, the way elections at Nova Scotia has uh, things set up now that uh, there's no excuse not to vote. The uh, situation has been made so that it's easy uh, any day of the week between now and October 8th, except Sundays, to uh, uh, cast your ballots. And, again, I urge everyone uh, to get out there and do yeah. just that. Thanks, Rick. Absolutely. Yes, and thank you, so Rick. Much. Thank you all, guys, and uh, good luck on uh, October 8th. Thank Thanks. you. All right, we're going to take a break. We've got uh, a news update coming up for you, and uh, let me tell you that we're going to open up the phone lines uh, in the next hour. It'll be an open hour, a special uh, little open hour on a Thursday, and we want to hear your reaction to this debate and the CBC debate last night. Uh, 405-6000 or one 801 8255 are the numbers to call. And again, we're going to open up the phone lines between 4 and 5 o'clock. It's an open hour. Anything goes, but we want to hear your reaction to the debate here this afternoon, to the CBC debate last night. Are there winners? Are there losers? 
Give us a call again, 405-6000 or 1-877-801-8255. We've got a busy plate to still after 5 o'clock this afternoon as well. We'll be uh, talking about uh, some other election issues here. We'll talk about sexual assault. There's a big conference underway in Halifax today, uh, sponsored by the Avalon Sexual Assault Center. Uh, and uh, there's some concern that uh, none of the uh, politicians uh, showed up for the uh, meeting. We'll hear some uh, concern from that. We'll also uh, talk with the Nova Scotia Food Safety Network and hear what the, they think the issues should be in, in this election uh, campaign. All right, a news update to coming up uh, for very shortly. Uh, and uh, again, 405-6000 or one 877 801 Looking forward to hearing your thoughts, your reaction to this uh, debate here this afternoon and the CBC debate last night. Again, 405-6000 or one 801 8255 Stick with us. The news is coming up at the top of the hour, and then we'll go to the phones and hear what your thoughts are on this Nova Scotia election campaign. We'll be back right after the news. You've been listening to a special edition of The Rick Howe Show, Nova Scotia Votes 2013, The Leader's Debate. Brought to you commercial-free exclusively by Sleep Country Canada on News 95.7. <laughs> that is Scott Simpson. I don't. He's MacGyvering something. I don't know what he's doing. For who? I don't know. I think he's live streaming. Oh, so it's Yeah, it's an iPhone with a paper clip on it. Here we go. Careful. Okay.